Hello everyone, this is our class number 23. Actually, this is the second part of class number 23. We didn't get a chance to finish up the theory part for the principal component analysis last time. I believe we stopped here. We were talking about the applications of PCA and we looked into one example from the CFA level two reading number seven. And uh, let me go to full screen. Okay. So we were looking at two different portfolios. You know, the, the, one of them was DLC 500, 500, which stands for diversity about large cap. This is a 500 uh, equities with large caps and uh, large cap companies basically and uh, covering all the econo economic sector. You know, we have 11 sectors stock markets are covering all of the stock market with 500 stocks, large cap stock. And then the second portfolio is VLC 30, which is literally the 30 largest publicly traded companies, right? So the data set it consists of 2000 fundamental and technical features, right? So the, for technical features, you can think of, for example, moving averages, you know, Bollinger Bonds, you know, RSIs, things like that. For fundamentals, uh, you can, it, it, it's, it covers a very wide range, right? It covers, for example, the multi-factor models, you know, what is, we have size premium, we have, I don't know, uh, book to market, things like funnel French, three factor, four factor, five factor models. Those are all some kind, kind of fundamental features. And you can think of macroeconomic feature, features like consumption growth, GDP growth, interest rate, and et cetera. And just all those factors will add up and we call them the factor zoo. Think of it 2000 factor. Right, so this is huge. So why are we doing principal component analysis? Because we, will, we hope that maybe we can uh, summarize the fluctuation of the, the original data set by, by using only three principles, right? Principal components, maybe two principal components, maybe four principal components, right? And then at the end of the day, we want to visualize that, right? So if, I, if we want to visualize these things in two dimension, maybe we can extract some patterns that we couldn't do that by looking at 2000 uh, features, right? So that's the hope. It does not necessarily always work, but sometimes it does. So surprise. So for example, in this data set that we are borrowing from the CFA reading, very surprisingly, uh, the first three components are able to explain so for the DLC uh, portfolio, it's able to explain 90% of the total variation, which is insanely high, right? So if, you know, the, I think I've, I've worked with some other data sets that only had 100 factors, fundamental and technical. And the first three components were able to explain only 40% of it, right? So this 90%, I just want you to realize that it's not always that promising, right? You can explain you know, 90% of the fluctuation of the portfolio by only looking at the, the first three components. The same story for, the, for our VLC uh, portfolio, the very large cap 30 index portfolio. Again, uh, Three, the first three principal components are able to collectively explain 86% of the total variation in the data, which is again, very good news. Even the first two ones, you know, this is a lot, right? 60% plus 20%, 80% here. Let's say 45%, 30%, 75-ish to 80%. Again, only two, uh, using two principles. So we can, we can visualize it in two dimension and then see if you can extract some patterns, underlying patterns from the, patterns from the data. All right. Uh, another application of the PCA is basically the, the uh, visualization that we were talking about. Uh, PCA can be fed into other unsupervised and supervised learning models, right? So the idea is that we use uh, PCA as a pre-processing part of your EDA, explanatory data analysis, right? And we're gonna look at a couple of examples, one for unsupervised learning, and then we use the PCA as a pre-processing for a unsupervised learning models. And the other one is use it as a pre-processing to, to be fed into the supervised learning model. So we're gonna start with the unsupervised one. So for example, we're gonna use PCA with an unsupervised model like K-means clustering. So next class, we will be talking about clustering methods. One of them is K-means clustering and the other one is hierarchical clustering. But the idea is that you wanna look into the data and then before doing k-means clustering, you wanna see how many cluster you wanna end up with, right? Is it three, is it four, is it five? So we will talk about k-means clustering next class and you will see that one of the caveats of that model, unsupervised model is that you have to pre-specify the number of k. Uh, so what is K? Is it three, is it four? There are methods. So for example, there's Elma method, there is this silhouette, 
uh, score that we, we will be talking about next class. Uh, but in general, there is no rule of thumb that what should be that K. So maybe we can use PCA to shed some light for figuring out what is that number of K, right? So, and that's exactly what we do here. So let's say this is our data set. And guys, this is unsupervised, right? I just want you to do not be misled by the colors. So here we have three colors just for the sake of presentation. Uh, but in real world, the data is not labeled. So it means you can treat them all as gray, right? There is no color there. And imagine this is our data set. And we talked about, the, there was another interpretation of PCA, right? That was the closest hyperplane to the lines. And we were talking about the perpendicular distance. The difference between this PCA versus regression was that the distance was perpendicular. In regression, the distance was not perpendicular, right? Uh, so here uh, we can do PCA and go from three dimension to two dimensions. Now, again, I want you to think of all these dots as gray. You have no idea, the data is not labeled. And then you just stare at this two dimensional data and you say, okay, now if I wanna cluster them, how many clusters do you see? Maybe some of you see three clusters. Maybe some of you see, okay, maybe I have another cluster here, something like that, right? But it's either, either three or four then you get some idea that if I wanna do k-means clustering, which we are gonna learn next class, maybe a good number to think of is three, right? So this is how PCA is gonna help you. Uh, uh, basically it's going to be fed into other unsupervised learning models. Are we good? Okay. So another application is that, now we're gonna look at another application which uh, we will be using PCA as an input for a supervised learning model. And that, that, this is uh, what we're going to talk about, which is kernel PCA. This is really, really neat. And uh, the idea is that what if we want to use a linear classifier? You know, many classifiers that we have discussed so far, they were linear, right? Like our logis logistic regression or the mm -hmm. SVM, but uh, not the, not with the kernel is equal to linear, right? So that was a linear classifier. Either you wanna use a linear classifier or linear regressor to the data, but unfortunately the data is non-linearly separable, right? So what if this is the idea, right? Uh, we are gonna look at, uh, basically we can, we'll be replicating this one in class today as well. Uh, let's say we have only two features, estimated salary and age. And if you have standardized them, so that's why it's, uh, the average is zero. And then this is how the data looks like, right? At least in the train set. And as you can see, the data is not necessarily or clearly linearly separable. Uh, maybe if I can do this, uh, maybe we have greens here, red here, but this is actually, this, this line is the optimal line that the algorithm picked as a the classifier when, when, when you're using logistic regression. So you already see that there are lots of misclassifications going on here, right? The red ones here are misclassified, the green ones here are misclassified. What can we do? So one thing that we can do is that we can use kernel PCA and go, so the dimensionality is going to be the same. So I have two dimensions here, the dimension is going to be the same, but we're gonna transform the data such that we get rid of this nonlinearity. So synthetic, by using kernel PCA, synthetically we are going to higher dimension and then project, project back to lower dimension. The idea is exactly the same as SVM, right? So if you, if you see that, it's going to make a lot more sense. So this is the solution. So the solution is going to be kernel PCA and I'm trying to yeah, pull up the picture. So what PCA does by using the kernel PCA, uh, it's not going to be linear anymore, right? Uh, it's going to the, use those dot products. I think we barely discussed these ones in the SVM that uh, we use uh, dot products to go to higher dimensions and then project back to exactly the same story. What happens at the end of the day is that these dots are going to be transformed to these ones, but be careful about the axis, right? So we have PC1 here and PC2. Now the data, it's, it seems that it is linearly separable, right? Now we can apply our linear classifier, namely logistic regression, to this beautifully linear separ linearly separable data. Okay. So that, that's, that's the power of kernel PCA. And, uh, but again, it depends on the context. Sometimes uh, it works nicely, sometimes it doesn't. And uh, what should you do? You should try both. If the data allows, if, the, you know, if it is not super large, you, can, you should try both and see which one uh, is going to perform better. All right, that was another application of PCA. 
Okay, so uh, I think we answered all these questions last class, but let's quickly go over them. I'm having a little trouble seeing how PCA is unsupervised learning. I hope that it is clear now because there's no label. You know, if you have two dimensions, for example, if you're visualizing everything in two dimensional X1 and X2, we have a bunch of dots here and the dots are not colored. We don't have label for them, right? If the best performed models can easily handle high dimensional data, is dimensionality reduction mainly used for visualization? This is a very good question. Yeah, PCA was a lot more useful, maybe let's say 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. But now with the, you know, uh, with the improvement that we got from, for the compu uh, computing power, co computing computation side, maybe we use XGBoost without reducing the dimensionality of the data, right? That, that's a still an idea. So maybe the, the application of PCA is reduced only to visualization. So that this is not a wrong statement, right? But I don't, under, I don't want you to underestimate the power of PCA as well, right? So the, because that's a still something very valuable. Especially when you get a chance to go from 100 dimension to three dimensions or two dimension, and then you can explain 90% of the variation. That, that's awesome. That's really awesome. I'm still confused as to how PCA takes features that should be represented in four or more dimensions and change them to C in two dimensional form. Well, it basically it does it by using a linear combination, right? So it can be any, so it can be even hundred dimensions to two dimensions. So at the end of the day, you're, this is your data set, right? You have X1, X2, X3, let's say XK. Do I have Y here? The answer is no, right? This is, we assume that it's unsupervised. Then I wanna go from this dimension to two dimensions, PC1, PC2. So the idea is that whatever shape it has in the space, in two dimensions, it will be something like this. You know, we have PC1, PC2, and everything is going to be I don't know, we have two, two directions, one here, one here. And the, the, the second piece is going to be orthogonal to the first one, right? And this is a way that, you know, this is a linear combination of all the features. So we, we call them loadings, right? Factor loadings. So PC1 is a linear combination of X1, X2, X3, and et cetera. It's a linear combination of all of them. And PC2 is also a linear combination of all those things, right? And, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much it, how we can go from high dimension to lower dimension, in two, in two dimension, uh, let's say in this example. There was another question from the YouTube uh, comments as well, which says that what is, what is the downside of PCA? Uh, for example, if, if I have 20 dimensions, uh, what is the downside if I use 20 PCAs, right? 20 principal components? You're not reducing dimensionality. What's the point of that? What do you think? What's the downside? Let me, let me rephrase the question like this. If I have 20 features, right? Then if I use uh, 20 principal components, what percent of that variation I can explain the 20 principal components? 100%, right? So it's not gonna, uh, it's not gonna underperform in that, in that perspective, right? But is it better to transform, go from Xs to PCs? Yes or no, what do you, what do you think? Ryan says no, why? Do you remember the caveats of PCA? There was one downside. Right. So it's hard to interpret. You know, if, you, if you do not want to reduce the dimensionality, just to stick to your features, right? Because uh, it is hard to interpret the linear combination uh, if you're using a PCA, not kernel PCA. Kernel PCA is a nonlinear combination. If you're using a, the linear PCA, it's a linear combination of the features. So, the, and it's harder to interpret. So if you are not reducing the dimensionality, don't do that. And beside that, uh, if I wanna use more than two, three, four feature uh, principal components, it's going to go to the same category of curse of dimensionality, right? So if, if you have curse of dimensionality with 30 features, you have care of dimensionality with 30 principal components as well. That's the same story. All right. I think that's, that was pretty much it uh, for the second part of the theory. And then and next time, we're going to cover the Python part. Is there any question here, guys at home? You guys here?
All right, so let's try to replicate them in Python. <laughs> 